Hello, I'm Rhonda Stevenson, and welcome to Space Matters. Today, we're speaking to the author of The Overview Effect, Frank White. Frank graduated from Oxford University and Harvard College, and he shares with us insightful interviews with astronauts who have viewed the Earth from orbit in an overview, and how those meaningful experiences impact the way that they interact with people and society and their perceptions on Earth. So stay tuned. Hello, I'm Rhonda Stevenson and I'm here with Frank White, author of The Overview Effect. And I'm going to hand that conversation off to Frank right now. Frank, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Yeah, hi Rhonda, thanks for having me. So I'm a person who's been interested in space exploration my entire life. And the issue I would say has been, how do I express it? And I think that's, you know, I think that's true of a lot of people. I've met so many people who are fascinated with astronomy. They're fascinated with rocketry. They're fascinated with uh, space exploration in general. But the question is, I'm not a scientist. I'm not an engineer. How do I get involved? And so my background, just briefly, I was born in Mississippi. I lived all over the world when my dad was in the army. Got a taste for travel. And uh, I, through all that time, I, I guess the, the key moment, we lived in Germany. My mother gave me a book called Stars. It's an astronomy book that's still put out. Uh, I was 10 years old at the time, and it blew my mind. I just thought, oh, my gosh, there's this universe out there. I never really gave it much thought. So I got into astronomy, and then, of course, I grew up in the 60s, and so I was very influenced by Apollo, all of the uh, activities of the time, and Sputnik, of course. And all, all during this time, it was really clear to me, my skill set is writing, my skill set is social sciences, the history uh, kind of subjects. And I went to Harvard, I went to Oxford, again, studied politics, governance, uh, those kinds of studies. And I couldn't figure out how do I get into space. Uh, and I found the work of Gerard K. O'Neill. And fortunately for many of us, and there are many of us who consider ourselves Jerry's kids, he started the Space Studies Institute. And all you had to do to get involved there was to be a human being. And <laughs> Jerry was envisioning these large scale space habitats with thousands of people living as they do on the earth. And so everybody was welcome, uh, sociologists, scientists, astronauts, cosmonauts, whatever your background, you, in theory, you could contribute to a uh, a space community. And so therefore you could contribute to the Space Studies Institute. And uh, from there we could stop and I could tell you how that all led me into the overview effect, which is the current field of interest. And you're the author of the overview effect. Can you tell us what inspired you to write the book? Yeah. You know, strictly speaking, there are three books that have overview effect in their title. And uh, we call call them the Overview Trilogy or the Overview Effect Trilogy. But the first one was called the Overview Effect Space Exploration and Human Evolution. And what's important is this book is about experiences of astronauts, cosmonauts, space travelers. And it started with an experience. That is to say, yes, I was interested in space. I was writing about it. I was giving papers about it. But the overview effect itself really happened as an experience because I was on an airplane flight cross country and giving quite a bit of thought to what would it be like to live 
somewhere between the earth and the moon in one of these communities that Jerry was talking about, looking out at the earth from a distance, it occurred to me, those people will have an overview. They will see the planet as a whole system where everything is interrelated, interconnected. I was also studying systems theory at the time, so that all fit into it. And I thought, it won't be a big deal for them, but they will just kind of know things that we struggle to understand from, from the surface. We don't see these connections. We don't see how there are no borders or boundaries on the planet. They will just know it. And the term overview effect came to mind. And not long after I landed, I decided, well, how can I confirm this hypothesis? This is, this is what a hypothesis is. You, you attempt to explain something with a statement like that. And I thought, well, the only people I can think of to talk to are astronauts. They're not permanent space community people, but they're closer than I am. And so I called NASA and asked uh, the public affairs guy if I could come to Houston and interview all the astronauts. <laughs> and uh, uh, I think I made his day. I think that was a very funny request. And I'm sure he got other funny requests every day. He asserted that if I came, I could interview two astronauts, which I was crestfallen. That's not enough. And then he said, why don't you interview retired astronauts? We don't have any control over them. They can do whatever they want. Well, that was the key to the whole thing. And by uh, 1986, I had interviewed 16. And I had a contract with Houghton Mifflin to write the book. And the book came out in 1987. Um, and, and the point I'm making is often I know people write articles about what I've been working on. And they say, well, Frank White was interviewing astronauts about their experience. And in interviewing them, he came up with a term for it. And that isn't really what happened. And I, I emphasize it because the overview effect is both an experience and a theory. But it starts with an experiential um, you know, beginning, uh, and it's hard to explain. The astronauts are constantly saying, it's very hard to explain what I experienced. Um, and, and that's also why it's taken a while, as in 60 years or so since the first human orbited the Earth, taken a while for Earth-bound people to really start getting it and, and uh, really understand what the astronauts have been actually trying to communicate. They were trying to communicate this before I came along. Sure, I have like a million questions. I can't imagine how okay. that was at, at the beginning, just, you know, uh, knocking on doors and, and asking for an interview. Mm -hmm. uh, who was the first astronaut you interviewed? You know, that I don't actually recall. I'd have to look at my records because I did go to Houston, and I interviewed Jeff Hoffman and Don Lynn, and those were great interviews, and I, I still am in touch with Jeff. Jeff actually has an experiment on the Perseverance rover, Yay. so I've been emailing him about that. Uh, but I don't recall which came first, because when, when the, P, the public affairs guy said, interview retired astronauts, I started networking around and uh, kind of funny thing happened. Uh, Brian O'Leary was uh, very close to Jerry O'Neill. He was a, he, he was actually an Apollo astronaut. And the interesting story of his life, if you can imagine becoming an a Apollo astronaut and then deciding I don't want to be an Apollo astronaut anymore. Uh, so he actually did not complete the program, even though he had been selected. 
but he had a lot of contacts at NASA. And he connected me to Joe Allen. And I know that Joe Allen was the first retired astronaut that mm -hmm. I talked to. And uh, what was funny about it was that I was not prepared. I, I knew Brian was trying to help me with that. But I was at work one day, and it was back in the day, no email, none of that. I think we had a PA system, and somebody said, Frank, uh, Joe Allen is on the phone for you. <laughs> so I picked up the phone, and I just made it up. You know, I just, that, that was my interview. But Joe was an Apollo uh, ground control, mission control person, and then he flew on the shuttle twice. And he made one of those famous statements about Apollo. He said, uh, for all the reasons pro and con for going to the moon, no one ever said we should look, do it to look at the earth. But that may be the most important reason. And, you know, that resonates over and over again. Bill Anders has said something like that. Um, and if you think about it, it's really remarkable that, apparently no one really had a good understanding of what was going to happen when we saw the earth from that greater distance. Now, bear in mind, people had gone into orbit. We did, we did have an experience of the overview effect. Sure. But not from a lunar mission, which is a much greater distance than orbital. And, and so that's how it all began. I, I had my two active astronaut interviews, and then the other 14 in the beginning were all networking, finding people who would introduce me to uh, astronauts. And, you know, I had two reactions from the retired astronauts. One was, I'm really glad you're doing this. We really need to get this message out. And then the other the other uh, reaction was i i doubt you're going to succeed oh yeah and here you are alan bean said I, i'm pretty sure it was alan who said this one of them said if i had a dollar for every writer who told me they were going to capture our experience i would be a wealthy person and i began to understand why rhonda when i started writing the book Nobody had been there before. Nobody had done this work before, except there was one person, Stan Rosen. Stan Rosen, Air Force Academy graduate, uh, Air Force officer, medical doctor, I believe. Mm -hmm. He actually had been doing the work, but I didn't know it at the time. I didn't discover it till recently. And that was through Rod Pyle. Sure. Uh, I, I met Stan Rosen through him as well. So yeah, I did not know that that uh, Stan had written more than one paper back in the mid '70s, and he had been talking to astronauts. And I think he captured a lot of what was going on. But in my own mind, nobody's been here before. I'm just out here on the frontier, trying to explain this phenomenon. And um, there were many times when that statement rang through my. Uh, mind that it's not easy to capture this and it's still challenging because there's still there are depths to what they're telling me and and each astronaut bring another piece of the puzzle um, of what it's like to be in outer space and look back at the planet but also to look beyond earth into the entire cosmos and that's what the third book of the trilogy is about, is their experience of the universe. Mm -hmm. Did anyone um, speak on their experience uh, from, from the, the, the lunar overview, uh, not just the, the Earth overview? Well, yeah, I think I interviewed, I think the, the book is now entering its fourth edition. And at this point, there might be five interviews with lunar astronauts. And um, Gene Cernan really was articulate about the difference between being in orbit and going to the moon. And 
he talked about two different space programs and one being the orbital, the other being the lunar. And he pointed out when you're in orbit, you're going around the earth fairly quickly. It's like a roller coaster. And he said something like, there's no time to be philosophical about sure. it. And, and then he, he said something on the order of when you're on the moon, you know, you, you stop and you ask yourself, where am I in time and space? Because time is passing on the earth, but you're not, you're really unaware of it. This is another aspect of overview effect that's not emphasized very much, which is a change in your understanding of time in the sense that you begin to realize it's, it, it's highly relative. Uh, and it's all, it's all connected to the earth and, and to uh, it, it, its rotation, its revolutions. And you step outside of that system, even in orbit, you step out of it. Uh, I think it was Jeff Hoffman who said, I started to think in terms of orbits uh, or mission elapsed time, but we really didn't think of hours and minutes. So uh, Edgar Mitchell was also quite articulate about the lunar experience. And he said, it gets you to a more universal perspective. Um, I think the key to it is that if you're in orbit, the Earth is the dominant view. Sure. Yeah, if you ask an astronaut, they'll talk about, yeah, the stars are amazing beyond the Earth, and and I can see into the darkness of the, of the universe. And they do talk about the change in perspective and how the stars seem to have dimensionality and color, which we don't see on the earth. However, when you're on the moon or on the way to the moon, the universe itself is a big part of the story. And, and you do see the entire planet. You see the whole earth. When you're in orbit, you don't really. You, you're seeing a part of the earth as you pass over it. And this is another insight about space travel that has not penetrated our consciousness, which is that space travel is, is a transformation of consciousness. Mm -hmm. Our consciousness changes. And people say, well, will we have the overview effect on Mars? And the answer is not exactly because... If you're in orbit, you see oceans, you see continents, you see features. If you're on the moon, you see those, but in a much different way. But if you're on Mars, you don't see any of that. You see a point of light in the sky. That's the Earth. And I call that the Copernican perspective. Going back to Copernicus, which is realizing we're part of the solar system and starting to get a consciousness of that system as what were another another uh, whole system that we are part of and then of course you know you keep going further and further we've all seen the pale blue dot that carl sagan talked about and we are only beginning to understand as earthlings. We are earthlings, as Nicole Stott says. We are earthlings. But how long will we remain earthlings as the earth um, becomes less and less prominent for us? So we're gonna we're gonna change we'll have to change psychologically to adapt to that fact. We you we and we have discussed that in in your class. We have. <laughs> it happened. It happened. Uh, so as as you um, present the the overview uh, effect, it, it's it's an experience, but also a theory. Uh, mm -hmm. When astronauts come back to Earth and and you talk with them about um, what their their initial experience was. Where do you find um, 
the the interesting commentary that adds to the theory of that impact. One of the interesting things that happened here is, again, if we think about that insight I had on the plane, that's the hypothesis, and it's about space community people. Actually, that part of it hasn't been confirmed, really, because we still haven't interviewed any space community people yet. We are getting a little closer. If, if I interview somebody who's been on the International Space Station for eight months, now we're getting closer, you know? But something dramatic happened to the whole theory in that as I started interviewing astronauts, I found out, oh, they're born on the Earth. They plan to come back to the Earth. They don't live permanently off the planet. So what I thought would be an ordinary reality, which is, oh, there's the earth in the sky, you know, kind of like, oh, there's the moon. Now, every once in a while we look and say, oh, my goodness, look at the moon. It's so beautiful. Or it's a full moon or it's a uh, we do get excited about the moon. But the fact that it's in the sky is not overwhelming for us because we we were born with it there. And, but when an earthling gets onto a rocket ship or in a high stratospheric balloon and then looks back at the earth, it's a bit shocking. And we, we've started talking about it as a shift in worldview. So actually there's, there's a, there's a bit of a new theory or sub theory and a new hypothesis, um, what we're seeing is everybody describes it differently and everybody has a different story, but it's become pretty well known that people find it remarkable that there are no borders or boundaries uh, on the planet. And we know it intellectually, but we just have never quite experienced it. Of course, I experienced it in the airplane. I mean, you you can experience it if you choose to in a way. But uh, Sandy Magnus made, made one of the most relevant comments when I asked her, what did you get from being an astronaut? What's the one takeaway? And she said, it's the difference between intellectual knowledge and experiential knowledge. I know we live on a planet. We're taught that in the schools. I actually know everything that you experience, you know it in a certain way, but you you do not have experiential knowledge of it. She really emphasized, we don't really know what gravity is till it's taken away. And uh, she said, I when when I came back to Earth, I couldn't I couldn't figure out how we get anything done in gravity because it's just so liberating to be in zero g. But Astronauts comment on the thinness of the atmosphere that protects us from the, from outer space. A lot of them are impressed with that. And uh, it, it leads from that experience to wanting to do something about it. Like there's the overview and there's the effect. Like I'm looking at the earth and I know right there what we're passing over. There are people shooting at each other across a border. I can't see that tends to make you want to do something for world peace or Absolutely. I see how thin the atmosphere is. It makes me think I have got to do something about the environment. And there's really a shift in identity too, because astronauts begin to look for, oh, there's Houston or there's my home. And then they begin to look for the United States or France, wherever they're from. And then they stop doing that. And they begin to just identify with the entire planet. And so this has led to this global movement called bringing the overview effect down to earth. Okay. And uh, the hypothesis here is if we could supply more people with the astronaut experience, the world would be a better place because people would be more collaborative, more understanding. 
Uh, one of the last more recent interviews I did was with three astronauts on the International Space Station at the moment that I did the interview. And one of their points was that person next to you looks really different from you and you may feel uncomfortable with them, but for all your differences, being human is a really critical common reality for you. And, and so we, you know, we begin to feel like if more people had this experience, what we hope, and it is just uh, a hypothesis again, they'd be more empathetic. Uh, you know, people, astronauts talk about before I was in orbit, if I heard about somebody on the other side of the planet having an earthquake or a disaster, I wouldn't feel very connected to it, but now I do. Sure. You know, and it brings out this whole mentality that we're all in this together. We're going to, we're going to make it or not make it as a species. And uh, we have to be careful not to become believers <laughs> in this. But what it's led to is, of course, support for commercial space flight, support for virtual reality experiences, more and more people are thinking, how can we bring the overview effect down to Earth? Sure. And, that. <clears throat> and with that, I'm sure that there have been a lot of comments, a lot of discussions on uh, how the overview effect as an experience creates um, greater sense of purpose and greater empathy for your fellow man. Mm -hmm. um, certainly some things that we could we could use right now in these strange times right and i see it as a potential uh counter to polar polarization when when i look for example at the politics of the united states and i look at the the political differences between uh, different groups and parties what i realize is it is the worldview of the people that's in conflict. That is to say, how I interpret everything that happens filters through this worldview and how you interpret everything that happens filters through your worldview. And it's very, very difficult to agree on any common ground. So what I would hope is that if the worldview of the overview effect became the worldview of the world, then we would be able to get along better. And, and I've said this many times and people seem to think it's kind of interesting. A planet has no sides. Uh, a planet is a sphere. And as I said before, it's a whole system. And when we divide ourselves into sides, we don't function like the crew of Spaceship Earth no. at all. And, uh, you know, that's what we need to do. We need to be functioning like the crew. And if you think about the International Space Station, it's a microcosm of what we're talking about because they function together. I, they're not automatically in agreement on everything. I'm sure they have disagreements. I'm sure they have difficult interpersonal interactions, but it's very clear to them that they can't let that become dominant. Right. You know, otherwise they can't achieve their mission and they'll be wasting this incredible, uh, you know, structure that's been put there by other people at a huge cost. So they overcome it. And, <laughs> you know, I'm not, I'm not looking for everyone to start singing Kumbaya uh, all over the world and loving one another. What I'm hoping is that as people understand the overview effect and understand our commonality, we can overcome the differences, not, not get rid of them, but overcome them. Sure. And you're also a part of an organization called the Human Space Program. Can mm -hmm. you tell us a little bit about that? 
Yeah, I'd be happy to. So this really goes back to the overview effect. Uh, it may sound like something totally different, but it's not. When I was finishing up the first edition and reading what the astronauts had told me and thinking about what they had said, it just became obvious that space exploration is a human endeavor. It's just too big for one space program. It's too big for NASA. It's too big for ESA. Uh, and the universe is enormous, of course. We know that. And even the solar system is enormous. So the idea of a human space program was birthed in the first edition. And the reason I call it that is to contrast it with a national space program. And once again, the intent is not to get rid of national space programs, but to look at how can we create more cooperation mm -hmm. and more collaboration. And it's occurred to me, for example, I'm very excited about the three missions that went to Mars. Mm -hmm. And it may be for the better that they're different because we may learn different things. But I also thought about the fact that I don't remember anybody saying, why don't we go together? <laughs> why don't we uh, pool our resources and see what we can do? Uh, three countries going to Mars together. And in general, the default is NASA has a project, ESA has a project, the Chinese have a project, the Russians. So the human space program was intended to lay the foundations for a human space program. And one of the ideas that really is driving it is the idea of a central project. One of my colleagues, Bruce Shackleton, who's a psychologist, gave me an article about central projects. And it talked about big projects like the Gothic cathedrals as being something everyone came together in a, in a particular society to do something that a few people couldn't do. It would stretch over a long period of time. And in the end, you'd have something you could really make use of. And even though, if you think about Gothic cathedrals, of course, that's a, that's a Christian effort. It doesn't appeal to everyone, I'm sure. And it, it's the creation of a building. It's physical, but it has spiritual and, and psychological effects. Sure. And this article mentioned Apollo as a kind of a micro central project. So I suggested that the human space program begin in the year 2000 and extend to the year 3000. So it's a millennial project. And I guess you could say we're 21 years into it right now. And uh, the, the way that it is sorting out in reality mm -hmm. is that we've created uh, the Human Space Program Incorporated, and it's been incorporated in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts as a nonprofit. So we're now going to apply for 501c3 status um, is and, this an organization that anyone can be a part of? Um, yes. Well, ultimately, I mean, I don't think we have enough work for everybody yet, but uh, we're trying to get to the point where uh, anybody could become a part of it. Sure. And, uh, and our first goal is the solar system, or we like to say the solar ecosystem. And our um, our motto or our mission is to create a central project that will ensure the ethical, sustainable, and inclusive expansion into the solar ecosystem. An important part of that is avoiding problems of the past. We've had great periods of exploration in the past, which have also been periods of really incredible exploitation and we're still trying to fix what we did 500 years ago. And 
you know, you can see it in people abandoning Columbus Day, and uh, you can see it in the whole idea of decolonizing all kinds of institutions. Well, we'd like to avoid our descendants doing that, uh, having to do that. And so we're, the, the structure of what we're going to do is we're going to have 16 task forces that will confront the big problems, the big issues. And they will report in and we will create out of that a plan for exploring and developing the solar system. And it will include, I would say, more than recommendations. It will include principles sure. of, about how we're going to do it. So some governance and some theory on how to make a new society. Right. Essentially, what would a solar civilization look like? And we're going to then run simulations to see if it works. And this is where a lot of people could get involved, is where we will have different people being uh, involved, maybe different people being involved in the government of Earth, people being involved in the government of Mars, people involved in the government of the Moon, and then we'll throw a problem at them and see how they, how they w work it through. Sure. Uh, so we don't want to just create a report that sits on a desk. And one of the analogies that we've made, which I think is very easy for people to understand, if you look at the Earth, almost everywhere you go, you have planners, right? You have city planners, you have regional planners, you have international planners. It's a well-known profession. And you have developers. Planners and developers work together, sometimes against one another, but they're symbiotic. I mean, if everybody's a planner, nothing ever gets done. And if everybody's a developer, a lot gets done, but you might not be happy with it. So we want to be the planners. And our feeling is there are quite a few developers out there already. And I think a classic case is Elon Musk. And uh, I have great admiration for his successes and all the things he's accomplished. And he says, I'm going to build a city on Mars. Right now, there are no zoning laws. <laughs> I mean, right now, I, I don't know of any, um, any structure, any system other than the, the Outer Space Treaty. Mm -hmm. There's nothing that says, well, that's great, Elon, but you need to do it within a certain framework. And what kind of regulations are there going to be? What kind of, you know, layout and planning types of things need to be taken into to account? And um, ultimately, who's responsible and who decides? Yeah, and again, I, I think a good city planner is not the adversary of the developer because you want development to happen. You want economic development in particular. And so this is not to stop uh, space exploration or development, it's, but it is to uh, think through some of the great problems in advance. Um, you know, I've often told this story, once I was in Boston traffic, which is one of the worst cities for traffic in the country, and I was really not in a very good mood. I was uh, trying to get somewhere, and I, I was <laughs> going pretty slowly. And I, I looked at the car ahead of me, and it had a bumper sticker. And it said, peace on Mars, dot, 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 just thinking ahead. <laughs> and uh, I, my mood lifted. I thought, I really, if I could catch that guy, I'd like to talk to him. Because that's sort of what we're talking about, is we're, we're trying to think ahead and we're trying to avoid having any regrets about this. We have an incredible opportunity. I think everybody I know who's gotten involved in space exploration in many ways does it because they see an opportunity for humanity to start fresh, to do things in a way we haven't done before. And if we're going to do it the way we've always done it, then I think 
a lot of the uh, advocates would not not be as excited about it. What would you say to the people who um, have the counter argument uh, and, and, and taking into the account of the overview effect? Well, why should we send people out into space or why should we develop a space when we have so many problems and so many issues that we need to solve here on Earth? We mm -hmm. should funnel all of our resources to fixing these issues before we start looking farther and further uh, mm -hmm. to implement our, our civilization. I think it's an argument not to be dismissed. Uh, it's, a, it's a very uh, interesting argument. One of the responses I have is the plan we're talking about is not abandoning the earth. It includes the earth. And one of the criteria for our task forces would be that we, we want to find things that we can do as we expand outward that will benefit the home planet. And so that's an important part of it. Now, uh, you know, the other, the other, um, the other response I would have goes back to the whole idea of limits to growth, which had a big splash in the 70s. And it inspired Jerry O'Neill, really, because Jerry O'Neill read the book Limits to Growth, and he's, he didn't disagree with it. He just said the only way to, to deal with what they're talking about <clears throat> is repressive restrictions on human freedom. And he didn't want that. And it's often forgotten that the O'Neill vision, which Jeff Bezos wants to implement, includes moving some of technological civilization off of the earth in order to liberate it from the impact we're having. And uh, in Limits to Growth, they, the original book, they talked about the possibility that we would enter into what they called overshoot, which would be population, energy usage, everything we're familiar with, would be beyond the carrying capacity of the planet. And then they updated that book in 2004. And they said, now we're in overshoot. We're in the overshoot mode. And that was 16 years ago. And I think that we are in overshoot right now. So one of the ways to deal with that is to look at the solar system as our environment rather than just the earth. So all of the solar system is now part of our ecosystem, not just yeah. where the atmospheric boundary is for earth. Right, absolutely. And one of the one of the reasons that the human space program is reaching out to environmental organizations is that the environmental movement and the space movement were connected for a long time. And O'Neill was a part of that. Uh, Stuart Brand was a part of that with the whole Earth catalog, demanding that NASA give us a whole a picture of the whole Earth because he knew it would uh, have, have an effect on consciousness. If we can bring the movements back together so that as we look at space migration, we take into account the problems of Earth, and we don't, we're not running away from them. Uh, my view is some of us need to leave the planet without leaving it behind. Sure. And um, I, you know, other metaphors that are interesting are birth, you know, that is to say, uh, when the baby is in the womb, it's a very comfortable environment, everything is provided for. The, the baby and everything. And uh, it's painful to be born. <laughs> you know, it really is painful to be born, but you reach a certain point where that birth really does need to take place. And even though it might be painful, it can be beneficial. And Rusty Schweikert, when I interviewed him, he said, you know, after I was born, I saw my mother in a different way, obviously. And I 
she took care of me and then I began taking care of her. So the overview effect in the way it changes awareness, I believe creates a greater desire to take care of the home planet, you know, and um, no astronaut has ever said to me that I've interviewed my takeaway from being an astronaut is we need to get off of this planet and go colonize other planets. They don't feel that way. So I think that'll happen, you know, that this desire to solve these earthly problems will just be increased and more people will think outside the box about how to do it. I don't, I, you know, in, in response to people asking me that question, I always say I take, I take that seriously and I really hope what I'm doing will, will, you know, we'll do both things. We'll, we'll leave the planet and save the planet. Well, with all of that, thank you. Can you give us a, a bit of an insight of how this relates to your curriculum at Kepler Space Institute and the certi 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 certificate, certificate program that you offer there, or that is offered by Kepler that you teach? Yeah, well, you know, I'm, I'm actually teaching um, three different courses there. Uh, one of them is more focused on the psychology uh, of space exploration and the overview effect. It's also more of an introduction to space studies for people who are, are wanting to learn more. Uh, another one is <coughs> human systems integration. And that actually, in its purest sense, re refers to integrating the human into a technology like, you know, okay, we're going to build a space shuttle. How do we integrate people into that and make it work? And I've expanded that to how do we integrate humans into the solar system? Well, and, uh, with, or you've, you've used a term before that, that I really like it's um, homo spatians. Right. Yeah, and that actually is in the third course or emphasized in the third course, which is um, facing completely and directly the fact that, as Rod Pyle says, uh, space hates people. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and I've added, I've added to that, but people love space. Mm -hmm. And that's really our conundrum, which is the space environment is not designed for us at all. The earth environment is. And um, as you know, in, in this other course, which is human performance in space, we look at zero gravity and we look at radiation and we look at other aspects of the uh, environment, like, you know, there, there's no air. <laughs> There's no air there. And, and we look at all of these issues, and even though we may have a somewhat optimistic and romantic view, we start thinking about what's going to happen as we move outward. And homo spatians is a term that I developed when I wrote the first volume of the book. Uh, because I was talking to Peter Diamandis. I interviewed him for the book. And he told me about speciation and I didn't know anything about it. And he suggested that the space environment might reproduce environments on earth, which um, lead to a new species being born. I mean, we, it happens all the time on earth. And it basically happens when- Mutation or mutation. Yeah. It, it's basically when individuals who are part of a species get isolated from the main body, the main gene pool. Most mutations don't carry forward because they're not adaptive. In other words, they're not useful. And so as they're absorbed into the larger gene pool, 
they don't persist. But imagine a group of animals who, because of a flood, they're isolated on an island. And the food supply there is very different to what they're used to. And they begin to adapt to eating that food. They begin to adapt to uh, foraging for that food. And eventually they're very, very different from their fellow animals. And over time, they may reach a point where they cannot mate with those other animals. They are a new species. Now, we're not used to that part on Earth because we really have one species of human, that's Homo sapiens. But if you look at other animals, there are many, many species within a, uh, an animal grouping. So Peter said, you know, weightlessness and radiation and isolation are part of what's going to happen when we leave the planet. And so speciation may occur to, I mean, we see in weightlessness, the body suddenly starts to change dramatically. People look different. Uh, they, see you know, differently. Huh? they see differently. Their bone density yeah. changes almost instantly. Right. Every organ in the body changes and including the brain and not much work has been done on that. But over time, imagine in a zero gravity environment or a micro gravity or lower gravity environment, people start to look different. They start to think differently. And one of the things I didn't know, and I did research for the course to find this out, that going back to our animals, let's, let's say it's uh, monkeys, that the the monkeys on the island monkeys might look so different from the land-based monkeys that even though they could mate and produce offspring the land-based monkeys say i don't know who you are i don't you know you're not attractive to me right <laughs> you know and the same thing could happen with humans that over time you know people wouldn't be attracted to one another and then, of course, a topic you and I've talked about is, well, that's natural evolution. You know, we are familiar with that on Earth, but we now know how to do genetic engineering. We know how to do gene editing. What's to stop us from creating homo spatians? That is to say, um, preemptively adapting humans to be more functional. That brings up a lot of controversial topics um, that that come from the discussion of transhumanism. How do you think that this is different? I think it's really similar, actually. Um, transhumanism is basically saying that we, Homo sapiens, we're not the, the end of the evolutionary process, nor should we be. Um, and so transhumanism and posthumanism is all about hacking the human genome and making it better. And um, it is an ethical issue that really has to be looked at. And I think it would be it would be the kind of thing we'd look at with the human space program. Sure. Uh, should we adapt to Mars or adapt Mars to us? You know, both. Both outcomes have ethical, ethical um, foundations. Um, one of the things I've noticed in researching genetic engineering on Earth, which I think would be the same in a space community, is it seems that number one, most people do not have a problem with uh, gene editing to reduce the incidence of disease. Uh, sickle cell anemia is one that comes up a lot. So if I could prevent your child, if you're going to have a child and I could prevent your child from having a given disease, why wouldn't that be okay ethically? Most right. people seem to be all right with that. But 
people find it unnatural, and it is unnatural, to, to say, if I can give your child a higher IQ, why wouldn't you want me to do that? And, you know, the argument goes both ways, which is, okay, if, if you send your child to this prep school, they're going to have a better education than the public school. And if they go to the prep school, they're more likely to get into an elite university. If they get into an elite university, they're more likely to do well in life. And we have problems with that, and yet we live with it. And in, in addition to the idea that um, it's okay to deal with disease but not enhancement, the issue of equality or equity is the big one. And so why, why should I be able to do something like that for my kid but someone who has a lower income or someone who uh, lives in a different part of town or what for whatever reason whatever bias or whatever has given them uh, less opportunity in life why shouldn't they have gene editing and again isn't that what we're talking about with healthcare in general um, you know bernie sanders says over and over again healthcare is a right not a privilege and i think we're moving toward that idea mm -hmm. so then if we start thinking about people living off the planet i believe many of the issues will you know come up again the same issues but it'll be more urgent because you're saying I'm using gene editing, gene editing to let people survive on the moon. Sure. They're not going to survive if I don't do this. So that's another dimension of the ethical side of things. So we covered a lot today. Um, mm. <laughs> wow, this was great. Thank you so much. Um, you. In closing, would you share with folks what your thoughts are on where you think uh, we'll be in, in 10 years with regards to exploration and space development? Yes, uh, I think I, I, I'm going to give people one concept that I think is going to be the key. And that's the concept of the exponential curve. We've seen it with other technologies like the internet, uh, the iPhone, uh, many, many other, there have been many other cases uh, of exponential change. And the, the key of it is that a particular technology may move along at what seems to be incremental rate. And you look at it and you say, nothing happening here, move on, move on, nothing to see. I believe that's what's going on with space exploration and development. A lot of incremental steps. Yeah, we've been looking at it for 60 years and say nothing, nothing much to see here. With the private sector getting involved and a lot of uh, financial impetus behind the private sector and the fact that we have a global engagement, that is to say not just two countries being spacefaring countries, but you know, the United Arab Emirates has a probe at, on, not on Mars, but circling Mars. The point is, I think what's going to happen is we're about to hit that hockey stick moment where the curve goes up. I think it's going to happen in the next few years. And we're going to be astonished at how fast it takes off. And that we have a great deal of act activity off the planet. And one of the reasons I'm so concerned that we do the human space program is I think if we don't do this plan right now, the hockey stick is going to take off and it's going to just happen, uh, well, without a plan. Let's put it that way. So sure. I think in the next 10 years, 
we could see people living permanently off the planet or semi-permanently, uh, a huge amount of entrepreneurial activity, uh, a space economy, and many of the things you and I have talked about a lot will become reality instead of science fiction. I think that that continues to be all of our hopes. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much for your conversation and your insight today. Sure, my pleasure. That was a fantastic conversation. Thank you so very much, Frank. Thank you for your insights and your time and your interest and conversation that is sure to continue. For those of you who joined us today, I would like to share with you uh, Frank's book, The Overview Effect, Space Exploration and Human Evolution. This is available on Amazon, highly recommended. And then another book that will come up in conversation frequently when we're discussing space evolution into space, whether that be through uh, settlement and colonization. Um, but this is a staple, The High Frontier by Jerry K. O'Neill. Uh, this is also available on Amazon, and I encourage everyone to get their copy today. And that's it for Space Matters. Thank you so much for joining us today, and we'll see you next time. Bye.